Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to have you join us today as we get into a discussion about uh, discovering carcass value and some of the differentials across the carcass. I think as we start out here, I'd like to just mention that uh, we sure realize that there's lots of conversation today in the beef business about uh, carcass cutout values and how that relates to fed cattle prices. And uh, at many times the, the big gap between the two, let's just be honest, that is a current event today. And we really want to recognize and, and understand that, um, that that's, a, that's a current event and it's very important to uh, all of us in the, in the beef production business. But at the same time, that's not the purpose of our uh, webinar today to have that discussion in, in particular. We are going to uh, really stick to mostly uh, carcass value and talk about what drives the differential uh, up and down the quality chain or, or the grade scale, if you will, uh, from one end of the carcass uh, to the other. So we'll go ahead and get started uh, with that discussion, first of all, with uh, a few slides to set uh, a little background for you today. I think as we talk about the value of the certified Angus beef brand, how it relates to uh, the choice cutout value and select, uh, I think it's important to uh, have a little background first on how the brand functions. After all, if, uh, if a person doesn't understand the functionality of the brand, it's pretty hard to capitalize or to produce cattle uh, with that focus in mind. So uh, to get that portion underway, we'll start with a, a fairly involved chart here uh, this afternoon. And there are two things here of importance on this slide uh, to get the ball rolling. First of all, uh, the red bars on the slide indicate uh, the proportion or the number of Angus type cattle that are uh, identified as eligible on an annual basis. And we'll talk about what that eligibility really means and define it here in a moment. But my purpose here is just to show that we do have uh, an increasing general trend in the number of Angus type cattle uh, that are identified annually as eligible for the, for the brand. And the USDA graders had the opportunity to look at um, about 15 and a half million cattle last year that were deemed eligible as they entered uh, the licensed packing plant facilities across the country. As well, then the uh, percentage of those eligible carcasses that were actually certified into the certified Angus beef brand is depicted in the, uh, the black line. And that's been a success story for the industry uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so in terms of the amount of improvement of cattle that are accepted into the certified Angus beef brand uh, and really the carcass merit that has driven that trend in those black hided uh, eligible cattle. So about 36% in 2020 uh, of those eligible cattle actually did meet all 10 carcass specifications, which Dr. Clark is going to review for you here in a few moments. But again, just to talk about how the cattle flow through the system and uh, eventually become certified into the brand as a, a certified carcass, first of all, feed yards have to merchandise cattle into uh, one of our licensed packing facilities. You can see here on the map that we have uh, a great number of, uh, of licensed packing plants across the country, more than 35. And obviously they would be primarily located, uh, as you might suspect, in the central part of the country, although we do have a quite a vast array of a geography that they cover, including those Canadian uh, licensed packing plants. But just a representation of not only where cattle are typically harvested uh, in North America, but also uh, in relation to uh, the location of feed yards. I think that's fairly intuitive for most of us uh, as we look at the map. Talking about the companies that are licensed to produce the certified Angus beef brand, we uh, are fortunate, fortunate enough to penetrate more than 85% of the fed cattle packing base in North America through our many licensed packers. So these names, many of which I know will be familiar to, to a lot of you are, um, are the proud partners in the packing sector that produce the certified Angus beef brand. And without them, of course, we wouldn't have uh, a brand uh, functioning today. So uh, quite a bit of availability of market um, access for feed yards as well as ranchers that are participating in the next sectors of the business. 
Let's go back to that eligibility topic as I touched on earlier. You know, what does make an animal eligible? I'll show you a better uh, photographic slide here in a moment. But as we look across the fed cattle sector, uh, those steers and heifers, including those Holstein steers that are uh, in the marketplace as well, about 58% of the fed cattle um, are identified as eligible uh, today. Now, if we just look at, if we take the Holstein portion out and just look at the beef type only fed cattle, uh, we're at about 69% uh, of those animals today eligible for the brand. That's a 20 year success story as well uh, with the heavy Angus influence in the, in the evolution, uh, about a 20 percentage point increase uh, in 20 years in that uh, eligibility number. So uh, really a growing influence of cattle that are eligible for the uh, certified Angus beef brand and other Angus brands as well. So we talk about the live animal specification. Uh, really this slide depicts it just very clearly. Uh, the brand specifies that cattle must be black over the main portion of their body. That's behind the shoulder and above the flanks uh, with no white crossing the midline over the top of that shoulder as well. And also excluding the, uh, the switch of the tail which can also contain uh, some, some non-black or some white color as well. So the top two animals, that solid black animal and then that black baldy, those are both eligible. And these bottom two, for instance, that black nose Charlet influence steer is not eligible. And this uh, highly white marked up steer on the right also ineligible for the brand. So as those animals enter the licensed packing plant uh, facility, that's how they're identified uh, from a live animal basis. But our brand is really about carcass specifications as well. That's where the rubber meets the road. And that's what uh, Dr. Clark will talk to you about here shortly. But to continue that chain of identification, once those animals are identified in the packing plant uh, upon uh, harvest, they're identified as being eligible based on that hide color. But once the hide comes off, we have to maintain um, that identification in some way. So traditionally over uh, the history of our brand, that purple A stamp on the rump of the carcass was uh, the primary way, A for Angus, to identify, hey, here's a, here's a carcass that needs to be further evaluated under the 10 carcass specifications to potentially become a certified Angus beef uh, carcass. Now, and today, uh, we see more packers identifying with some of that food grade purple ink on the hock of the carcass, simply because it's more preferred to uh, color up the hawk rather than uh, that round of the carcass. Both of those methods, certainly acceptable, but that's how we maintain identity through, uh, through the packing plant. So when we get down to it and we look at those black hided eligible cattle, we're most interested in what proportion of those actually are accepted into the brand based on the 10 carcass standards that we'll describe uh, shortly. Today in 2020, as a matter of fact, 36% of those uh, eligible cattle were successful in making it into the brand. And so it's really been, a, again, I, I mentioned a 15 to 20 year story of how um, grading in this country has improved in terms of uh, the marbling trends we see in the fed cattle supply, particularly uh, those cattle that are Angus influenced carrying quite a bit of uh, the improvement as well. And so this 36% is, uh, is a pinnacle of, of the story of the certified Angus beef brand. At this point in time, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Diana for um, a trip into the, into the meat lab. I think she'll have uh, a nice uh, visual session for you. She talks about the 10 uh, carcass specifications. This is uh, Diana Clark. I'm at Worcester, Ohio, beautiful Worcester, Ohio. I have to actually clarify it's it's actually cloudy and rainy outside, but it's 61 degrees. So we got a good day going here. We're, we're surpassing winter, hopefully. Um, and we're, we're warming up and getting ready to, uh, to get some crops in the field, that's for sure. Um, so just a little bit of background about where I'm at right now. So I'm actually at our culinary center in our meat lab. 
And we usually host groups here, uh, typically three to four groups a week. We slowed down a little bit because of COVID, but we're actually ramping back up. So if any of you are ever in central Ohio, I highly encourage that you stop on in. We are always, always, always welcoming people in. We want to show you our operation and have you truly understand what is certified Angus beef. Because a lot of people look at it and think, oh, it's, it's just a bunch of marketing, okay? But there's more to it. There's actually a lot more to it. And that's really what's hooked me onto the brand. So just a little bit about myself. I actually grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. I had no background in agriculture. Please do not leave the webinar now that I just told you that. However, I stumbled into agriculture. I went to University of Illinois. That's the bright orange gloves that we have here. Okay, they're not poke Oklahoma, all right? They're actually University of Illinois, bright orange gloves there. Um, but I went to University of Illinois, thought about going to vet school and stumbled into meat science while I was there and really fell in love with agriculture. And that's the beauty of this role here at Certified Angus Beef is we have these groups come in and we try to give them this farm to fork experience. So we take them out to a ranch, we show them cattle, we show them what they eat, we bring them back to the culinary center, we break down sides of beef room, and then we also have six chefs on staff. Well, then we'll kind of take those cuts, cook them, and show how to prepare them in the best way. So they leave full, happy, and educated. And it's really become a passion of mine to educate people on what goes into agriculture production. And I find it just fascinating the minimal amount that people know. And I just like to connect those dots. And so that's what we're doing here for you today. We're trying to connect the dots from the producer to that meat science world, because there is a lot of marketing that goes into our brand. Sure. I mean, we are definitely a marketing company, but if it wasn't for the science that go into our 10 specifications, we would not be where we are today. Okay, so it takes that great production and Angus breed, and then coupled with the science that goes into our specifications that we're going to walk through that really drive out the value of a certified Angus beef carcass. So I'm going to show you three slides really quick. The first one is just uh, 10 specifications uh, this listed. You guys can quickly look through those 10 specifications and see, yeah, there's, there's some in there that, I mean, you just saw a slide that Paul had showed that had 36% of those black hided animals actually make it into the brand. So I'm gonna pose a quick question. Which specifications out of those 10 do you think are most pertinent? Which ones kick out the most number of black hided animals in our program? And I'll give you, I'll give you a second to think about it. If you wanna throw it in the chat, you're more than welcome to, um, but just kind of thinking about which ones are there uh, you have a lot of different uh, different marbling, you have hot carcass weight, so we got to kind of think about those. All right, now the next slide is actually going to show you the top four uh, that actually would kick out cattle from our program. So if you look at them, and now the next one will actually show you the percentage-wise, we're going to walk through these specifications of seeing the actual sizing of that ribeye, the, the marbling, the amount of back fat, and the overall carcass weight as well. So you have some variability in these animals, okay? These animals are God's creatures, and that's really the goal behind these specifications is to provide high-quality beef in a consistent manner. So now that we know that, let's dive into this side of beef that I have next to me. Because what I want to do is walk you through those 10 specifications so you can walk away with that knowledge of understanding what makes something certified Angus beef. So we have a side of beef right here. This is actually a left side of beef. And it's taped up a little bit, not because it's falling apart or anything. It's actually just taped up showing you where all of the primals are. Okay, so you have your rib, your plate, your chuck brisket. You have your round, your loin, and your flank is sitting back there, all right? So we also have a lot of ink on the carcass. Now, this is uh, a side of beef from Boliant's Packing, which is the small packing plant. You guys saw that one certified Angus beef logo in Ohio. That would be Boliant's Packing right there. So they still put a lot of ink on the carcass. It's not really typically found in industry anymore. As Paul was saying, they try to remove that ink because if a consumer were to see something that was not red or white, they think something's wrong with it. When truly this is just telling us that the beef is safe and wholesome to eat and giving us some clues about grading. 
But the one area that's really, really particular or important to our brand is this right here. Okay, this rib eye surface. This is where the animal's been ribbed between the 12th and 13th rib. And you can see the marbling that it was within that cut. This reason why this is so important is that this rib surface is very indicative of what the rest of the animal is gonna cut out to be. So we know how much muscle, how much fat is gonna be found on the rest of the animal based on this surface alone. So it really can predict the overall value. On top of that, from a marbling standpoint, we know if we have marbling here, it's also going to be indicative of the marbling that we find in our round and in our chuck. And we'll have more marbling as we move closer to our head down that longissimus dorsi. And you'll have more marbling as I move up into my strip loin closer to the tail. So this is the most conservative view of marbling in that longissimus dorsi or your ribeye or strip loin, okay? So we know if we have enough marbling here to make it into certified Angus beef, we're gonna have enough marbling throughout the entire carcass. So to start, a USDA grader is actually going to be the one evaluating to make sure if it makes it into certified Angus beef or not, which is great because that means it's a third party entity and they have no in on whether or not it makes it. They're not gonna get paid more if they have more certified Angus beef in there or not. They don't care. They're just truly evaluating the animal for the overall quality. Okay? So what they're going to do is start off with the marbling. So they have these official USDA marbling cards. It literally says that, okay? They usually carry these around with them. And essentially, they're, they're like a calibration tool. So that way, every day, they can go in and set their eye to a specific amount of marbling, knowing that if I'm a grader in Texas or if I'm a grader in Illinois, I am going to have that same calibration tool each and every time. So that way, they can fall into the same ballpark, okay? So we'll start with a minimum amount of marbling of select, okay? So this is the minimum amount that I need to make it into the select grade. And just to clarify, we have select choice, and then prime. Those are the three major categories within the USDA grading system. So if I were a USDA grader, I could hold this card up next to that ribeye and say, okay, does this ribeye have more or less marbling than that card? And I clearly can see that this ribeye has more marbling than that. So I know that this would in fact make it into USDA select because that has enough marbling there. So the next category, if you guys were listening, you should know that it is choice. So it's a little bit different than select. There's not just one category within choice. There's actually three categories. We have small, modest, and moderate, okay? So it gets more and more marbling as I move up the scale. You guys can even see that in these cards. So this is the minimum amount of modeling that's small or low choice to make it into the USDA choice category. But some of you might heard of the upper two thirds choice or top choice, a top choice program. If you've done livestock judging, that would be talking about these two right here, that modest or moderate in terms of modeling. So the average choice or high choice. And a USDA grader again would take these cards and evaluate. He can hold them up next to that ribeye and say, okay, does this have more or less marbling than that? I think it has more marbling than that low choice. And then again, he would move on to the average choice or modest amount of marbling. Does it have more or less marbling than that? I think it looks pretty accurate to that modest. But if he wants to check the moderate, is it gonna have more or less marbling? I don't. It's kind of close. I'm not going to, I'm going to call it an average choice if it was me. If any other uh, meat judges are out there watching this, you guys can say if I'm right or wrong, but I'm going to say that this is about an average choice. I'd call it um, I'd going into that high choice category. Okay. But some of you may or may not know, if you recall reading those 10 specifications that certified Angus beef says we must have this modest amount of marbling or higher. And there's a reason behind that. It's not just because, oh, well, you know, these are the better of the choice category. It's more saying, no, we want to have the modest amount of marbling or higher because that's when a consumer is actually going to notice a difference. 
So when they wrote these specifications, they consulted with a meat scientist from the Ohio State University. I have to say the, because I'm in the state of Ohio. I know it's ridiculous, but they fine you if you don't hear. But looking at this, okay, so this modest amount of marbling are higher when he was doing research, he noticed that if I did a blind taste panel of this low choice versus my average choice, consumers could actually distinguish a difference. They always thought this modest amount of marbling tasted better. It was juicier. It had more flavor. It was more tender. And he said, if you're going to be a branded beef program that hangs its hat on quality, you need to start where consumers are going to notice a difference. And this is when consumers actually picked up more flavor. So that's why we start at modest amount of marbling or higher, because we want consumers to take a bite of that steak and say, wow, this was good. Whether they're buying it from the grocery store or they're eating it at a restaurant, we want it to be the best experience that they possibly can have. Okay, so that's our first specification. Then we're gonna look at the type of marbling that we have. We wanna have a medium to fine textured marbling scattered throughout that ribeye. In the basic way to explain this, we have a slide kind of showing that texture of marbling too, those differences. But the basic way to explain this is thinking about a baked potato. So if you ever had a baked potato, you go and you order it from a restaurant. They usually ask you if you want all the extra toppings, you know, your bacon, your butter, your sour cream, whatever else you put on it. And then what do you do next? Before you take a bite of that baked potato, you mix the whole thing together because you want to have that buttery goodness throughout the whole potato. I promise no one really likes baked potatoes. Everyone loves mashed potatoes because that's essentially what you're creating, right? So they mix all of that buttery goodness together so that each and every bite has that flavor to it. Same concept here with that medium to fine textured marbling. We want to have it scattered throughout the steak so every bite has that flavor, okay? Then we also wanna look at the age of the animal. So we wanna make sure that we're working with a maturity animals or less than 30 months of age. And we do this by actually looking at the dentition of the animal. So as the animal is on the harvest floor, that head is still attached to the carcass and they have someone standing there evaluating those dentition. So they make sure that there's not more than two adult teeth poking through that bottom jaw. If there is, then the rule that's over 30 months of age and can no longer qualify for certified Angus beef. But as long as I have all of those baby teeth or just two adult teeth poking through and nothing more, the rule that's under 30 months of age and can now make it into the brand. And the main reason why this is important is because of tenderness. The older an animal is, the tougher the meat is going to become, okay? So I have some pretty tough meat on me, I'd like to say, right? But the younger the animal is, the more tender they are. And that's what a consumer is looking for, is tenderness. If something is tender, they perceive it to be more juicy and more flavorful. So we don't wanna have some older animals mixed in with the program. Now we have uh, those first three specifications that really focus in on your tenderness, juiciness, and flavor. Everything that consumer looks for when they're going to eat a steak, okay? So now that we know that we're satisfying our consumers by those first three specifications, we need to think about who's using the product. And that's where this really separates ourselves to from other brands, and specifically just from USDA grades in general. So our next three specifications really focus on consistency and sizing. So we require at Certified Angus Beef that the ribeye size must be between 10 to 16 square inches. And you can see by the image on the screen, it's simply from a plate presentation standpoint, or even if you're working in a retail store from putting that in the case, if you have that large ribeye on the right-hand side of the screen, you know that's gonna hang over the edge of, those, of the, um, the little tray that they put the meat in. It's gonna be really hard to overwrap. If you're thinking about a chef, he's trying to cut 12 ounce portion size steaks. He has a, a ribeye that's 24 square inches. He's gonna have to cut that paper thin. Wow, that's a big thin dry steak, right? Yeah, no one's gonna wanna say that. We wanna have that 10 to 16 square inch ribeye to give us that consistency so we can have some good solid steaks every single time. And that way it gives chefs consistencies because you need to think about their world. 
they're not just working with beef, although we would love it if that's all they worked with, but they're not, okay? They work with poultry, they work with pork, they work with paper cups and plates. They work with things that are a bit more consistent than beef. Beef is part of, it's a, a biological creature, okay? It's, it's God's design. So we know that there's gonna be variability in it. And it's great that there is, but we just wanna drive home some consistency to really make it easier for that end user so then they come back to the brand every single time because it made their life easier. So what a USDA grader would do is use this ribeye card. And you can kind of see there's like squares in there and some dots. Um, that is actually showing us if I were to hold this up to the ribeye, I could count all those dots on there. And each dot is one tenth of a square inch. So I could add all that up and see how large that ribeye truly is. And again, it just needs to be between 10 and 16 square inches. But you might also see that we have that 10 square inch mark and that 16 square inch mark on the card, the green and blue lines. So what I can do is put this up there and make sure that that ribeye falls in between the two. And as long as it does, I know I am good to go, okay? So because I have that, I know that this guy is within 10 to 16 square inches and we're set. And it's as easy as that for that grader to evaluate. So then we also want to look at another one that was a big uh, thing that got cattle kicked out was that back fat thickness. We want to make sure that it's less than an inch of back fat. So what they would do is measure three quarters of the way down. And sorry, it's an inch or less of back fat, but three quarters of the way down and this guy's at six tenths of an inch right there. So we know that it's good, but that means it has enough room to go up to that one inch mark. And the main reason why we wanna do that is to make sure that our yields are in check throughout the animal. Because if we have over an inch of back fat here, we know we're gonna have extra fat throughout the carcass. And when you have that extra fat on the animal, a lot of times it's just gonna be trimmed off and thrown into rendering or possibly grinds, but it really reduces the value of the overall weight of that. And we wanna make sure with certified Angus beef that when someone's buying a rib or a sirloin or a chuck roll, that they're paying for the quality of the meat and not the extra fat that was on there. Because that packer is gonna to have to trim that fat off. And if his yields are lower, they might have to up the, increase the cost of it in order to cover that difference. Okay, so that's why we want to have that consistency and fat cover. And we know when you're using Angus genetics, you can get the marbling without having to worry about how much fat you have on the animal as well. Another one in terms of consistency that we look at is the hot carcass weight. So this one has a hot carcass weight of 706 pounds. We want to make sure that it's 1,050 pounds or less. This one I'd say is a puppy compared to what's usually going on in industry. So right now I think we're between 900 and 950 pound is the average hot carcass weight. Um, but we just have this little lighter weight heifer given where we're at in, in Ohio and uh, just where things are being grown. However, we know that if we have those hot carcass weights that are above that 1050 pounds, we're starting to see larger weights in our chucks, in our rounds, okay? And we want to have those consistent as well. We want to make sure that regardless of what product you're ordering with certified Angus beef, you have some consistency in sizing. So by putting that hot carcass weight cap on our program, it helps reduce the variability that's found in our box. Okay, so that's why we want to make sure that it's 1,050 pounds or less. And then our final four specifications that we have really pick on some uh, variability that we can have in the beef industry. And we wanna make sure that we weed out any oddballs that we might find, okay? So the next specification that I wanna talk to you about is actually a, a light muscled cattle. So we wanna make sure that we have big, beefy, robust, your Angus type, you know, your Angus type cattle in our program. We don't wanna have any light muscled cattle that might easily be mixed into our program. Because if you look at the image on the plate, you're gonna be disappointed if you're that diner on the right, okay? This is the classic scenario of I like to call of plate envy, you know, where you go out with your significant other and you order the exact same thing and you know, yours gets to be that one on the right and the, your significant other is the one on the left. Well, yeah, 
usually I just want to say this for the record that the female usually gets the one that looks worse. I, I don't understand why it's like she won't notice or something, but I notice. Okay. I don't say anything because I'm just worried that they're going to like spit my food or something. But, you know, I just, I just want to show you that they have those inconsistencies within the beef industry. We all know that a lot of dairy cattle might end up in the program in, in the beef industry. We also know that a lot of dairy cattle or just light muscle cattle end up in the beef industry. Not everyone has the same genetic advantage that Angus ranchers do. Okay, so looking at that, we want to make sure we weed out any of those light muscled cattle in our program. We do not want to have them in there just simply so we have that consistency in steak presentation. Now, another one that we want to look at is actually looking at another type of cattle. We want to decrease the amount of Brahmin influence that we have in the program. And we do that by looking at the neck hump itself. And you can see that image on the screen. So on your left-hand side, you have a, a more of your boss Taurus type animal that doesn't have a very large neck hump, okay? They would make it into certified Angus beef because that neck hump is less than two inches. Now your boss Indicus type animal or your Brahmin animal, they are going to be excluded from certified Angus beef because they have that large neck hump. And it's not really because of the neck hump. It's not like, oh, we don't want to have large neck humps in our program. No, it's, it's more of the enzymes that are within the muscle. So with certifying SB from a food service standpoint, we require that the meat be aged at least 21 days before it makes it to that restaurant, okay? So that way we have these enzymes within the meat that are called calpanes or calpastatin that actually break down the meat to make it more tender okay so your calpanes are the things that are breaking down the meat to make it more tender now both brahmin and uh and angus or bosindicus and bostaris cattle they all have those calpanes now one thing that brahmin cattle have a bit more of than your angus type cattle or your bostaris cattle are calpastatin and calpastatin actually stops or inhibits those calpanes from working so even if we age those Brahmin cattle 21 days to make the meat tender, they're still going to be tough. So that's why we wanna make sure that they don't fall into a certified Angus beef brand box because we wanna make sure that our meat is tender, okay? So another easy way to think about this is the game Pac-Man, okay? Because now you guys have heard these terms, calpanes, calpastatins, I kind of understand what they mean, but I don't truly get it, okay. So Pac-Man, I feel like everyone understands Pac-Man, at least if you're the, over 15 years old, you probably should. If not, then I'm getting really old. But, so you have Pac-Man, he's going around eating those dots, all right? You can think of the song in your head, that won't, 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 okay? So he's going around eating those dots. When he's eating those dots, that's like Calpane eating the meat, breaking it down, making more tender, okay? So Pac-Man is Calpane making the meat more tender. Now we have Calpastatin, which is like those ghosts in Pac-Man. So calpastatin comes around, it hits calpane, game over, okay? You can no longer have that tenderness achieved. Those Brahmin cattle or Bosindicus cattle actually have an increased amount of calpastatin in their system. So you have more ghosts that are on the screen. You're at a higher level in Pac-Man. So you're not gonna be able to get more tender. And hopefully that helps it make a little bit more sense. Cause I know that's really deep down getting into some science here, but you can see that there's a lot of science that goes into this brand, all right? Now we have two specifications left. The next one I'm gonna talk about is, is actually uh, called, we don't want, we're practically free of capillary rupture, okay? And uh, there's gonna be a picture on the screen. Now this is a, a wicked nasty case that us a bunch of meat nerds took a picture to show everyone. So you're welcome now that you've seen it. Cause I was kind of like, oh, you see it at the plant. You're like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And then you realize that you're just that meat science kid that people think is really weird. But okay, it's a really cool picture to see because you can really see what capillary rupture is. Now, you might also notice that there's a few little dots at the top of that ribeye on the right. If it just had those few little dots on the ribeye, it still would not make it into certified Angus beef, okay? We do not want you to pay for a Cadillac if it had a scratch on it. We don't want you to pay for a premium brand if it has a blemish. So we don't wanna have it in our program. 
And the main reason why we don't want this, if you think about from a retail standpoint, there's no way that would ever sell in the case. A consumer is definitely gonna think something's wrong with it and they're gonna discard it. It's gonna to have to be discounted and go on sale before anyone purchases it or it's just gonna be turned into ground beef, okay? So we wanna make sure that their animals are valued all the way through and we don't wanna have any of those blemishes on them. So we will remove these from the program. And then finally, our last specification also removes any dark cutters from our program as well. Again, from an appearance standpoint, it simply does not look good. And a consumer, when that's compared next to that bright cherry red ribeye, they're gonna think something's wrong with it. Although both of those, the dark cutter and the capillary rupture are completely safe to eat, they still just simply do not look good. Okay, and we wanna make sure that our brand is premium inside and out. So that it has enough marbling and it looks good from the case because people eat with their eyes. They need to see it and want it and purchase it. So that's really our goal behind those specifications. And I hope by us walking through them here in the meat lab gives you a little bit of insight about the science that goes in behind the brand. Because there is a lot of thought and engineering done to these specifications. And I know that what you guys are thinking that these specifications really have not changed much and they haven't over the past 43 years that certified Angus beef has been around, but we really do still sit and study all these specifications to make sure that they are pertinent and needed for the brand to excel in the industry. So now that you guys know really what makes certified Angus beef different, we're gonna push this back to Paul and he's gonna walk through and talk to you about the overall value, how certified Angus beef drives the value of a carcass. Well, excellent. Thank you, Diana. That was uh, quite a trip to the meat lab and going to be hard to improve on here uh, without such a visually stimulating uh, setting. But that, uh, I think that's really good to have to help folks understand uh, the functionality of the brand. And I'd say, you know, the majority of, of uh, cattlemen that I run into certainly don't understand every detail of uh, the specifications and how those impact uh, the final product. So that's very, very good. Um, We'll go ahead and move right along then into the reason that we're here, uh, which is to discuss uh, value discovery across the carcass. And uh, we'll get right to that now. So I think it's kind of neat to look from, from chuck to round and throughout all those major primals of the carcass and discover, you know, where, where are we driving the most value? I think we all are pretty well in tune to the fact that there are some premier cuts of beef, but to, uh, to dissect that a little bit further is, is certainly interesting, and that's our intention uh, with the rest of our time here today. So let's go ahead and uh, break down the carcass by weight, because after all, in the cattle business and in the beef business, we, we buy and sell pretty much everything relative to that animal based on pounds. So it's very important. Well, the correct answer uh, for our poll question actually was uh, the chuck, and you can see if you can follow along the percentages on these primals as we go, uh, the chuck makes up 29.6% uh, of carcass weight uh, hanging on the rail. Next, very close second, is the round at 22.3%. And I think just visually, a lot of us were looking at an animal or a fed steer or heifer, whatever the case may be, and that round is pretty prominent, but there's, uh, there's still more weight up there in that front shoulder in the chuck. So bringing up a very close third, as a matter of fact, is the loin. Yeah, I think this one's a bit more surprising that it's that close, particularly uh, as it relates to the round, but the loin is made up of a lot of cuts. Uh, and as we cut that thing out of the carcass um, on fabrication, it runs all the way down to that back flank, uh, down to that tri-tip. So the loin is actually quite uh, a heavy primal, even though we think about maybe the strip loin and the tenderloin being smaller in relation to the chuck and round, uh, the summation of that is still quite, quite large. In fourth place, uh, the rib at just 11.4% of the carcass. And I think from a value perspective, uh, we'd all like to see that about triple uh, that in terms of percentage. And we'll talk more about that here in a few moments. So now we're down to the final three of the seven major primal cuts. And you can see across the bottom of the carcass, pretty obvious that they're going to come in at lighter weights. So Next in line, uh, we have the plate, where those skirts come from, 7.1%. Uh, 
followed up by the uh, the brisket at five percent, and finally uh, the poor flank at just three point four percent of total carcass weight. So that's kind of the uh, the canvas that we're working with in terms of proportion to get us started. Now this is kind of the meat of the matter, if you don't mind the pun, but we're talking about carcass value and adding value specifically as it relates to the certified Angus beef brand. So as we look at carcass cutout prices for 2020, these are annual averages uh, for select choice and a certified Angus beef brand. We're leaving prime aside for this conversation primarily because the utilization of prime across the entire carcass is much smaller uh, than these other categories that we're displaying here. So even though prime is a big premium, we don't use as much of the prime under a prime actually uh, prime label upon merchandising to the end user. So you can see, I think obviously across the top, we have the, uh, the cutout values. So if we roll the entire carcass back together from uh, from a wholesale pricing perspective, we take it back out of the boxes and put that carcass back together with the appropriate values in terms of price and the appropriate pounds per each subprimal, then we get um, the carcass cutout value. And the difference, the difference in the spreads between those is really uh, the crux of our conversation today with, I think folks very, being very familiar with the choice select spread, in 2020, that was $10.40 per hundred weight. And specific to the certified Angus beef brand, that premium above the choice grade in 2020 was $17.57. So uh, that number to the right, that $17.57, I think you know, that, is, that is the real driver behind the certified Angus beef brand. The purpose of the brand is to add value to Angus cattle and that number right there is absolutely at the heart and soul of that very purpose and our mission statement. Now, if we go down here to the bottom then on, a, on an 880 pound carcass, which is the average of all steers and heifers in 2020, you can see if we uh, spread that, those dollars per hundred across that, eight, that 880 pound carcass, we get 91.52 spread, choice above select, and then on CAB above choice, $154.61. So some pretty uh, impactful dollars and cents there on a carcass basis. So now we'll give you an opportunity then, we'll look across each of those primals and see how particularly that certified Angus beef premium is spread across the primal. So the answer to the question is that it's the loin. And that comes from a combination of the fact that the loin weighs so much more than the rib, which many of you voted for, at 21.3% of total carcass weight, uh, that's 187 pounds of that 880 pound animal. So we've got a lot of weight, although still the third heaviest primal, right? But we also have a lot of price per pound value that comes across in the loin. We talked about the tenderloin. We talked about the strip loin. Uh, there are several other good cuts. We've got the tri-tip, uh, the top sirloin, uh, ball tip, and some other items. A lot of items come from the loin and a lot of them come at a fairly decent ticket or a higher price than other carcass subprimal cuts. So as a result, if we're just looking at the loin, kind of the same view as we had before, uh, the choice select spread, dollars per hundred is $27.25. And then the certified Angus beef premium above choice is $35.21. So that brings us on a per head basis, that loin contributing of that $154 total, that loin contributes $66 essentially to the total. So taking quite a bit of the load in terms of that certified Angus beef per head premium. Up next, no surprise then is the rib. And at only 11.5% of total carcass weight, we're clearly talking about some dollars per hundred weight or dollars per pound advantage here that the rib brings to the table since it's certainly not anywhere close to those top three primals from a weight perspective. I think interestingly about the rib is the fact that the choice select spread is quite significant in 2020 and has been in most recent years. The choice upgrade above select for the rib specifically, and we're talking about rib eyes if we're getting down to it, there's a lot of um, pricing potential difference between the two at $41.80. Uh, once we go from select to choice, we've taken out 
quite a bit of the premium, particularly in years prior to 2020. However, in 2020, the certified Angus beef premium above choice was still $29.71, uh, which was a real highlight last year for the CAB cutout value driver. So for the total per head, we get $29.81 brought to the table on that um, on the rib. Next, now a heavy hitter, the chuck at 29.6% of total carcass value. But surprisingly, perhaps to some of you, the choice select spread on the entire chuck is essentially zero dollars. So despite what we know about the choice select spread and all that it means to the beef business from a pricing perspective, when it comes to the heaviest cut or the heaviest primal, it really essentially doesn't mean anything at all between choice and select. That's kind of a fun fact. However, certified Angus beef, we still enjoy an $11.80 premium per hundred weight on the chuck. So very proud of that, that we're spreading some premium across the carcass uh, where, whereby the chuck does not do so, or the choice chuck does not do so above select. Still contributing $30 and change to that total cutout premium for CAB. Next around, the second heaviest, um, not a lot of premium here. I think a lot of us think about the round, we think about stew meats and items that uh, need to have a little more slow heat um, applied to them to make them as tender as we'd like them to be. And as a result, when we upgrade from select to choice and from choice to the certified Angus beef brand, the premiumizing opportunity, if you will, is a little bit smaller. You can see the numbers there on the screen again at $2.50 choice select spread and $7.62 on certified Angus beef. So the CAB premium per head brought to the table from the round is $14.95. Finally, down to the smaller cuts, briskets are more popular in the last few years than they ever have been as they've spread across the country and really heavily utilized in the, uh, the restaurant trade and very popular with barbecue and smokehouses and whatnot. Uh, these days. 2020 was not a highlight year for the brisket since a lot of that business was sidelined uh, in the restaurant trade, as you well know. So when we look at the economics of the brisket compared to the rest of the cutout value, uh, they were relatively cheap, actually very cheap in 2020. We look for that to come back uh, with the restaurant trade getting back on its feet in 2021 as we slowly march forward. You can see again the spreads the topic at hand, $4.38, the choice select spread on a brisket. And the certified Angus beef brand actually adds $10.35 uh, for the spread over choice. That's pretty doggone good. We sure wish that, that brisket weighed more with that much premium, uh, but still at just 44 pounds and 5% of total carcass value, it only contributes almost $5 per head to the CAB carcass cutout on that uh, total 880 pound carcass. Down to the final two now, the plate. Um, not many folks think about the plate when they think about dissecting the carcass and their favorite pieces of meat. However, those outside skirts are very valuable for export and provide quite a little premium. Back to that scenario again here where the choice upgrade from select on that grade scale does nothing for us to add value to the plate. The CAB plate, however, brings $11.71 per hundred weight premium. At only 62 pounds and 7% of the entire carcass, uh, that's $7.31 of added value. There's a cut that we would like in terms of certified Angus beef to be heavier because it sure does add some premium to the carcass where choice does not. Finally, the low leaf flank. Um, very popular, uh, particularly in, in, uh, in Mexican dishes and whatnot where we're perhaps having making fajita meat and other thin meat dishes. Uh, certainly an item that uh, performs very well there. Probably again, not one that some folks that most of you maybe think about in terms of a premium item, but we actually do get a fairly good upgrade on price per hundred weight from choice over select and certified Angus beef again up over choice, but still as the lightest item on the, uh, the carcass, $1.43 per head uh, for an 880 weight uh, carcass. So that gets us to the conclusion of our walk through each um, primal piece. So we're just kind of going to review quickly uh, here the choice to select spread on the entire carcass when we look at it from the aspect of both weight and dollars per pound or dollars per hundred weight you can see that choice adds most of the premium above select through the rib and the loin primals 
Yeah, I'd call it maybe more of a nominal amount with a round, the flank and the brisket and a couple of zeros on the chuck and the plate in terms of total carcass premium, okay? Now we get that on the production side of the game in that choice select spread and the proportion that we take home, perhaps as a cattle feeder selling cattle on the grid uh, throughout the year, you can see on a calendar basis over the last five years, you can see the, uh, the, uh, the five-year average there and the, what we have to begin the year in 2021. So our best opportunity to take advantage of a wider choice select spread is in uh, the early spring summer piece and then back in the fall again as well, when the choice select spread widens and we are uh, rewarded more for those more richly marbled carcasses. Moving on then to the certified Angus beef carcass premium above choice, now up to 7.4% greater across the entire carcass. Again, the choice select spread in a normal year prior to last year would have absorbed most of the rib premium um, but in 2020, CAB ribs enjoyed a 7.5% premium over choice. Look at the entire carcass. And I think what a lot of us are proud of at the Certified Angus Beef brand, what the brand has been able to do for producers is add value from one end of the carcass to the other. Uh, and those dollars coming back through in grid premiums for cattle feeders. And uh, here's, a, I think, a good graphic example of that. We have uh, the CAB carcass premium over the dressed carcass base price uh, throughout each of the months of the year for the last five years. Again, seeing some seasonality in that as well, similar to the choice select spread. But I think all in all, you'd have to say that um, when we're talking about true grid dollars back to the cattle feeder, that's a pretty decent incentive, um, all things uh, being what they are for CAB over the dressed base. And finally, showing you the growth here in certified Angus beef uh, carcass counts over the years. You can see the, uh, the gray bars indicate quite a good amount of growth, uh, about five and a half million carcasses certified last year. And then still the black line, the certified Angus beef uh, to choice price spread, while not a smooth linear line in the upward direction, we're sure happy with the fact that as many carcasses as we've added on an annual basis to the marketing side, we have continued to see the, the, uh, the premium for certified Angus beef coming back through grid dollars, also increasing over time in the face of larger supplies. So with that said, that's the end of the slides. And I think we've set aside a few moments here at the end um, to go ahead and address some questions and Miranda's going to come back in here and uh, I think walk us through that session. So Miranda, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Paul and Diana. We sure wish that we had the opportunity to bring everybody who's who's watching today into the Meats Lab, but in the absence of that, this was a, a good chance to talk some of that carcass value. Um, at the beginning, I rushed through some of my kind of housekeeping things as my rural internet was telling me it was unstable, something I'm sure many of you out there watching on rural broadband can, can appreciate. But just going to mention to all of you that this presentation will be available on cabcattle.com at the conclusion of the webinar. We've been recording it. We'll also go ahead and shoot you an email with it. So if you want to share this with any friends or colleagues, feel free to do that as well. But we are taking questions. Go ahead and drop them in the, the Q&A box there below. Uh, to get you started off with one, Paul or Diana, I don't know which one of you wants to jump in first. but What's the source of ground beef and does certified Angus beef offer um, a CAB ground beef product? I'm gonna let uh, Diana, if you wanna jump in here, since you are the uh, meat scientist, go ahead and tackle that. So just the sourcing of ground beef in general off the carcass, if I'm, a, if I'm a, um, understanding the question correctly. So you could actually get ground beef from anywhere on the carcass that you want. Um, we have primarily, I guess a lot is found in the chuck more than anything. If you think of your typical 80-20 blend that you find in retail stores, that's gonna be your chuck roll. Uh, we see a lot more of these, they call them signature grinds nowadays where they actually are trying to pick specific primals to be in that grind because it does amplify the flavor. Uh, for instance, your brisket ground is, has way more flavor to it because it has a lot more oleic fatty acid in it. 
Um, so we've seen people do a brisket short rib uh, chuck grind, but we also do have some just basic, your ground round, that would be your 90-10. Um, and then you can have a ground sirloin, which would be another lean source, your 90-10. So really they're using places all over the carcass. They really don't want to grind tenderloins, ribs, or strips for sure. Um, but they might use some of the trim off of those cuts too, to throw in a ground beef as well. So you're not really isolated just to one primal or any subprimals like that, but I'd say majority would come from the chuck followed by the round. Excellent, thanks, Diana. Um, next question, during this time of kind of pandemic related uh, supply issues or supply chain issues, how has that changed the value differences maybe in some of those primals? Paul, I don't know if you want to take that one. Yeah, that's been an interesting uh, pattern to watch as particularly as the restaurant trade has been, been sidelined. Some of the items that are heavily used in, in that regard have been devalued as their contribution to the entire carcass value decline. And I think the best examples, uh, we talked about the brisket. That one was uh, just glaringly obvious. I don't know uh, too many folks uh, in the country that are that are making a brisket themselves at home, although it's gaining ground. But that's primarily a, a restaurant trade item that uh, that became devalued. Um, the tenderloin trend would would be another. Now, certainly not uh, throughout the entire year because the tenderloin did actually carry quite a bit of value, more than I would have anticipated from one end of the calendar year to the other. But as the pandemic set in. There was a brief period where those got exceptionally cheap uh, as restaurants were informed that they had to be closed. It came back, came roaring back very well. And as a matter of fact, a lot of items that you that would traditionally not have been volume sellers at retail um, came right in there and were, were, were being moved at a pretty high price tag as well throughout the year. And I think a lot of folks understand that retail stores had a really a, a, a booming year and beef did as well, and, and through retail. But um, by and large, there weren't there weren't a ton of, um, of real bargains. But a few of those items, like those mentioned, did become devalued uh, due to specifically uh, COVID nineteen and the pandemic. I know the brisket here, Paul, was one that I I snagged a couple on some major discounts and put in my freezer to to smoke at my leisure throughout the year for sure. Um, another question we have coming in, and this one would be one for you, Paul, is when you're thinking about trying to target choice or CAB in your production, um, what EPD is kind of your target for marbling and ribeye? And they mentioned that they know about the targeting the brand, but what's what's some numbers you're looking at there, Paul? Yeah, the targeting the brand uh, uh, recommendations that we put out as a brand are a place to start. And that marbling number on that um, program would be a plus 0.65. And that's what we kind of consider the baseline. Now, if a, if a person were of a mind to uh, maybe strive for a little bit higher mark and, and maybe make faster progress, I would definitely want to be above um, a 0.8 if I were really wanting to put some pressure on it. Uh, there'd be others out there that would say you need to be over a plus one, um, plus one. So, it's, it varies a bit, opinion-based, but um, I think also as you look at the percentile rankings of the young sires or the, uh, the yearling bull offering, uh, that starts to limit the number of animals, particularly as you're going to buy a live bull, uh, as the percentile gets, uh, gets higher, the, the, num the number in the offering, of course, is lower. So um, I, I would look at that and balance it against um, those higher marbling EPDs. From a ribeye perspective, Depends on your cow herd, you know, and if you've got um, average above or below cattle from a mus musculature perspective, that's going to provide some guidance. And then there, I also like to look for uh, ribeye EPDs above um, a 0.7 or a 0.8. That's just me. Depends on your goals and what you think your environment uh, will be most suited to and how you're merchandising your, your feeder cattle or if you're owning those cattle all the way through and selling them on the rail. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. And if you need um, to kind of review any of those recommendations or thing, you can always check out cabcattle.com and, and see it written out too. Uh, this question, next question is also for you, Paul. Uh, does CAB come only from CAB licensed feed yards? If you want to kind of explain our history there and, and yeah. 
that's great. We do have some history with licensed feed yards. Uh, uh, that program where we used to have, uh, I think, 75 or more feed yards that were affiliated with the brand through a licensed arrangement, uh, that program is no longer active. Uh, it kind of ran its course and we had a very good, very good run with it. But today, uh, there are no licensed feed yards to produce cattle for our brand. And I think that's a point of clarification that's important that you know, anybody that's merchandising fed cattle to a licensed packer, uh, packing facility, as we listed earlier in the presentation, they have the opportunity to be merchandising a certified Angus beef brand carcass uh, once that's passed through uh, the USDA graders inspection. So um, it's, it's wide open and I think the market access to the brand in, the, in that more than 85% of the fed cattle base is, is just wide open. Thanks, Paul. The next question I think I'll kick over to Diana. Um, and that would be, is there any new innovative cuts from the check around that could be implemented at a small locker plant? If I, I don't know you, John, who asked the question, but I'm guessing that you're thinking of when you get one of your own kind of in the freezer, you're wondering if they could cut it up a little different. So Diana, if you've got any ideas on that, go ahead. Yeah, most definitely. So there's definitely a lot of value that's within that chuck um, and even in the round. I know a lot of people look at round and think, oh, you know, that's that's low, low quality. However, when you're working with certified Angus beef, you have um, a lot more marbling within those cuts. And it's really just how you're using your knife. Uh, we have some great merchandising sheets that show you how to break different cuts down, uh, but some in particular to really think about. And I'm hoping that your small uh, local packer can help you guys out. However, sometimes it's hard because they might have not learned how to fabricate this way. Um, I even know just from personal experience, trying to talk to some of them about breaking it down a little bit different. And it's, you know, it's kind of hard when you got a well-oiled machine, you're, you're throwing a wrench in there and it's, uh, it changes things up quite a bit. Um, but in your round, your top round specifically, you have a top round cap that's called the gracilis. Uh, uh, NCBA has actually termed that the Santa Fe steak. It's almost like a skirt steak. I think it's fantastic. I usually try to take every single one of those home um, because no one here really gets to know it that well. I probably should, should share the wealth a little bit. Um, I'm a little selfish now that I'm realizing that. Okay, but then there's another one out of the chuck called the Denver. So the chuck flap is a cut that's uh, the same as the short ribs. And that is a lot of times just thrown into your boneless uh, short ribs, but you can actually cut those as steaks about a quarter of an inch thick. Those are fantastic. And I think that's something that your local processor could easily, easily do. Um, it's just an extension off of that chuck roll. So I'd highly recommend looking into those uh, two options, at least to start with. And then from there, maybe we can dive a little bit deeper and find some other cuts for them to pull apart too, or just ask for the whole subprimal and then you could break it down yourself too. Excellent advice, Diana. Um, I'm gonna keep you on for the next question too, because this one will be, be in your department, I would say. And that is, why don't you find, why do you only find brisket flats and you're not finding um, brisket points offered in many places? Can you say that again? What, yep, why are you why are you only able to find brisket flats and not brisket points? And I'm sure I, I find that also in my rural grocery store here. So whoever asked that yeah, question. Yeah, that's a really I'm... good good question. Um, there's just more people are are going to those brisket uh, flats than anything. Um, it's not that they're not available, the points, uh, but just a lot of people don't really know what to do with them, so to speak. So most of the time, how I said before, that ground beef, that signature grind is taking the brisket, your short rib and your chuck roll. They're going to be using those points in that um, brisket portion of the grind. So that's kind of where those are going. But also, if you think about the average consumer of, of just smoking a brisket, a whole brisket's a lot to handle. A brisket flat is a lot easier for them to manage. I think it's easier for them to cut. Even if they don't know to cut against the grain, they're probably pretty naturally going to do that. Versus having that point, it's a little bit harder to figure out the web and everything like that within the brisket itself. Um, we do know a few packers that will have certified Angus beef points specifically, um, but it's definitely not available at retail yet. I just think the barbecue world needs to get a little bit bigger, which it is for sure, uh, before that happens. But I think, it, I think it will come one day, at least I hope so. 
Excellent. I always think when I'm doing mine at home, that brisket flat cooks faster. So that's the only the only advantage there, but not as much leftovers. Um, Paul, I'm going to kick this next one over to you. Um, and that is, is there a premium for superior yield grade cattle? There must be a cost associated with all that extra fat. The answer to the question is yes, there certainly is a premium for superior yield grade in cattle. And yield grade one carcasses would be the leanest. Typically, I think uh, listed at a $5 and change premium on the USDA report. So uh, per hundred weight, that's a pretty decent premium. And yield grade two is more in that two to $3 per hundred weight range. And of course, discounts for fours in the average of minus $10 and fives minus 15 per hundred weight. So that is important because when we're selling cattle on a grid, we certainly will not only be subjected to quality premiums and discounts, but also to yield grade premiums and discounts. But I think it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that um, the cost of all of that fat that's brought through in well-marbled carcasses um, is affiliated with, uh, with that yield grade system. Because as a matter of fact, if we optimize uh, merchandising timing of our fed cattle. In other words, if we get the cattle sold on time, which has been darn tough in the last 12 months, no doubt about that. But if we get the cattle sold with a half an inch or six tenths of an inch average back fat across the pen, oftentimes that's going to be determined with the eyeball, maybe not with so much precision. But if we get them sold on time and the genetics are right, in terms of high quality, uh, high marbling genetics, um, there's no reason we can't have the best of both worlds, have an acceptable yield grade mix, along with quite a bit of premiums from a quality grade and certified Angus beef brand perspective. It's all about finding that sweet spot, isn't it, Paul? Absolutely. I'm going to go with one last question here. So if there's any other burning questions out there that we haven't gotten to, please go ahead and drop them in the Q&A, respond to us by email. However, if you've asked them as an anonymous attendee, we don't know who you are. So go ahead and throw your name or your email address up there and we'll make sure and follow up with you. But the very last one, Paul, um, is CAB primarily choice B for the market prime? And how does that kind of play into the retail side of the business? That's a great question. Certified Angus beef has always included um, the prime grade from the standpoint that that modest zero and higher marbling is the requirement. So. Uh, from the beginning, prime was always included. Now, I can't quote the year, Miranda, and it's just my own lack of uh, understanding our, our, our own history, but there was, a, we added the prime label, certified Angus beef brand prime, uh, sometime uh, back in our history. So we have uh, that specific extension of the, of the label for prime. And of course, that commands more premium as well uh, from wholesalers and end users out there. So uh, we're capitalizing on both. Prime, the prime grade in total in the country is on the rise. So most recently reaching about 11% of all fed steers and heifers. So it becomes more significant, not only to our brand, but to the entire beef chain uh, as the proportion of cattle has risen from basically two or 3% to now often in that 10% range uh, in modern times. That's excellent, Paul. I know when I'm out, sometimes there's producers that will almost to apologize and say, no, I'm really not aiming for CAB, I'm aiming for prime. So that's a great clarification that we, we have that as well. Well, with that, I'm gonna close the questions and wrap up the webinar. 